And there we go. I think we're live. Uh, yeah, microphone's on, not on the floor. I think we're all good. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello and welcome. My name's Paul Grogan. Today is my monthly live Q&A. Uh, the text is really big on the right-hand side of the screen, but that's fine because my eyesight's going, so at least I can read it. Um, so yes, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. We are broadcasting on uh, YouTube and also on Facebook. I only have the chat available for YouTube, so thank you very much if you're watching on Facebook, but I won't be able to see any of the messages that you leave me on there. If you want to add any messages, then please head on over to YouTube uh, and put the messages in there. So yeah, today is basically my monthly live Q&A. My Patreon campaign uh, funds me to do one of these every month, and it's basically an opportunity for people to ask me any sorts of questions usually game, board gaming related, but I do get the occasional of the questions. Um, I'm going to answer as many of them as I can. We've got questions in, first of all, on my BGG Guild and also on a Facebook group, Board Game Trading and Chat UK Facebook group. Uh, and I'll be answering questions uh, that come in live. Now, something different today that we haven't done before. I am joined by my beautiful assistant who's waving in the corner. Um, so Vicky is here in the room with me because it's actually quite stressful doing these, reading all of the chat and reading all of the groups. So the plan is that Vicky's going to help me out today. She's going to be reading the chat uh, and any messages that uh, any comments that people have or any questions that people have in the chat. Vicky's going to add them into a document and then I should see those questions here. So save up your questions for now because what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through, first of all, all of the questions that I got asked on my BGG Guild and then on the Facebook group. So yeah, hang fire with the questions save them up and ask them in a minute. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves, obviously, but I'm going to start going through the questions first from the BGG uh, group. If you are not a member of my BGG guild, please subscribe now. Guild number 2258, join, subscribe, and you will get notifications and you'll see things in advance. Right, first one is from Chrissy. Uh, given that we've all been stuck at home for a few weeks, yep, uh, and for some of us that means spending more time with our furry family members, what have been the funniest and cutest things that our collection of companion animals have been up to? So we've got two cats, Thor and Loki, um, and they have had uh, a mixture of being cute and, and not being cute. Well, specifically Loki not being cute. So one of the cutest things that's happened, and this has actually only been happening in the last week, week and a half, in the, we'll wake up in the morning at like maybe six o'clock, 6.30, something like that, to find either one or both of the cats sleeping with us on the bed at our feet. So I'll, I'll basically wake up and I'll move over and suddenly find that, you know, Loki's there at my feet or whatever. So that's been really cute. Thor's been going absolutely crazy. Thor loves dice. So even yesterday he was going absolutely crazy, running around the house chasing after dice. Um, Loki tends to be a little bit more temperamental. Loki has got in the habit of, well, he's not, he's, he's actually been like this a while, but He's very, very loving, but only when it suits him on his terms. So for example, he loves sitting in this studio on the windowsill. And at night, when we're all about to go to bed, he comes in here. Now, I don't want to leave him in the studio all night because he might start chewing through cables. So what we do is we pick him up off the windowsill and bring him into the bedroom and you just get attacked. He just lashes out, growls and bites you and everything. So yeah, he, he can be very fussy when he wants to sit somewhere or do something and you're interrupting him. He doesn't like that. Um, right. John Dunnett has asked a question about, uh, is it true that Gaming Rules is running a slow pace through the Ages tournament? I don't know anything about that, John. Um, no, John has organised a through the Ages tournament because, and this is for the app, so the digital version of Through the Ages, the app that CGE have produced, they have recently added a tournament system. I don't know that much about it, but they've announced it. You can now organize tournaments using the app. And John has organized one for Gaming Rules supporters. It has been organized through the Slack channel. So if you are a Gaming Rules supporter and you want to join in the Through the Ages tournament and you're not on the Slack group, please drop me an email because John has said he more than happily run another one. We've got 16 spaces in the first one. That has now filled and that has started, but John's more than happy to run another one as well. So yeah, if you are a Gaming Rules so a supporter, if you're a Patreon supporter, but you're not on the Slack channel and you want to join in the Through the Ages tournament, uh, then yeah, drop me a message and let me know. A question in from John Watson. Uh, I seem to be doing a lot of gaming online at the moment. Yes. <laughs> what tips do you have the best online platform? So there's a number of ways that you can play games online. For years, I've been playing games uh, asynchronously with 
Board Game Arena, uh, Yucata, um, Boitage, um, there's a few of them. They are online interfaces which you can play through a browser and it basically it, control, it knows the game. So you will press a button and it will do everything for you. There's loads of games on there, some really good games on there, and I've been using those platforms for many years, and I think they're all great. I do have a preference for Boitage. Uh, once you get used to the interface, I find some of the ones on Yucata are very good, some of the ones are awful. Uh, and Board Game Arena, again, some of them are really good and a couple of them not so great. Recently, as many of you will know, I have been using Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia to play a lot of online games. Um, and my impression of them that I had, my opinion of those that I had, fairly quickly changed after I'd started using them. I found them a lot less fiddly than I, I thought they would be. They're still a bit fiddly, especially when you've got to zoom to one part of the board, pick something up, zoom somewhere else. That can be a little fiddly. But a lot of the mods that are available for Tabletop Simulator are fantastic. And I will be doing more streaming using, using those tools uh, soon. In fact, one on Friday night that nobody knows about yet. Um, recommended apps. So yeah, th those ones that I mentioned really. Oh, and there's also obviously, you know, actual apps that are available on iOS and Android for, for board games, which have got capabilities to play multiplayer. Have I got any inside information on Gloomhaven Digital? Yes, can't say anything. Uh, do you know when multiplayer is coming out? If I did, I wouldn't be able to say, but no, I don't. Uh, you need it to replace your physical game. So yes, you've watched a few of the streams. Yeah, we're loving Gloomhaven Digital at the moment. Um, it's me, John and Paul, we're playing it. We're using Skype to basically simulate the multiplayer experience and it's working really well. Uh, and we're gonna be continuing doing that. That's generally speaking, it's Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 p.m. There are certain times where I've got something on that I won't be able to do it, but generally speaking, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 1 p.m. Right, Scott. I know what this question is about already. Uh, Scott's been enjoying all of the streams. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, while streaming, which of you enjoyed the most? Wool, cotton or polyester socks? Um, definitely silk. Definitely my special silk socks that I only wear special occasions. Right, next. Questions in from Adam. Adam's got a few questions. So first of all, how, are, how is me and Vicky doing in this strange world and these crazy times? Well, thank you for asking. Um, the situation at home actually changed just before lockdown started because Vicky got a new job. So instead of driving, you know, an hour to work and then working till very late and then getting home an hour later and having almost no time at all in the evening, uh, Vicky's got a new job in Columpton itself. So her travel to work has been a, a lot less and she's home just after five o'clock each day. Uh, so yeah, life has been changed somewhat because of that. And also it, it's four days a week as well, which means on Wednesdays, like today, she's able to help me out doing some company admin and, you know, Lots of outstanding company stuff that I just don't seem to have the time to do. So yeah, we're doing okay. Don't know when the lockdown's gonna, how long it's gonna go on for. But yeah, if it goes on for another week, two weeks, three weeks, we'll just we'll just carry on. We're still getting out because the shops are within walking distance, so it's fine. Um, right, Adam is also asking uh, about Lord of the Rings: Journeys in Middle Earth, Star Wars: Imperial Assault. So why do I not like Mansions of Madness Second Edition? Now I recorded a podcast with somebody about this about a year or so ago, year and a half ago. That podcast has recently been taken down because the person who did that podcast, uh, a guy called Ben in Germany, is now a board game publisher. And in Germany, it is frowned upon quite a lot for anybody who works in the industry to actually produce uh, you know, media content creator things. They're, they're, Obviously, they can have opinions on things, but they shouldn't really be go producing any publicly available content when they are a publisher themselves. So he's taken down all of his content, um, but I did actually get a copy of that MP3, and he's happy if I upload it myself at some point. And I keep meaning to do that, and I've never got round to it. In, in short summary, I found Mansions of Madness second edition. It was really unusual because I played it three times, and whilst I enjoyed playing it, a game took three and a half hours. I played it three times, and every time it took about three to three and a half hours, which is too long. Um, it's advertised as 90 minutes on the box. It was a fun experience, but I felt that it was 99.9% .9 your, your decisions were meaningless, absolutely meaningless in the game, because you've got the choice of, oh, do I search through this drawer? Do I open a door? Do I do this? Do I do that? You push buttons on the app, and it randomly determines what happens, 
and I don't know, it was just weird. And combat, it's like, well, you're fighting this type of monster. Um, bladed, bladed weapons are good against this type of monster. Which weapon would you like to use? Do you want to use your knife or do you want to use the club? Well, you've just told me bladed weapons are useful against these monsters, so I'll use my knife. And then you press a button and a whole bunch of random numbers are generated in the app and it tells you what happens. It's like, well, I've no control over that. Now, the Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-earth is similar in a way. A lot of it is similar. But I found that the card play mechanism was definitely more... I felt like I had more control of what I was doing. Um, and I generally liked the, the stories as well in it. I also found that the Mansions of Madness was... Uh, there were three different types of puzzles that you can encounter during the game. And every time you encountered a puzzle, it was exactly the same as the one before. So the sliding block puzzles is exactly the same sliding block puzzle. It's like, oh, it was just a bit boring. I can go on for longer, but yeah, I'll, I'll try and remember to send you that podcast. Is there such a thing as a perfect game or do all games have something that need tweaking? So I like to do house rules for various games that I feel don't particularly fit well with me, but I still enjoy the game. Like Nussfjord, did three games of it the other day. Really enjoyed Nussfjord, but I think my slight tweak to the house, to the rules makes it a better game for me. Okay, that's fine. But do all games have something that needs tweaking? No, absolutely not. I've just played Mini Express this afternoon. It's on the channel now. There's nothing I would change about it. I've played it twice. It's not that I like to go in and house rule every game. The game was fine. The game was, was you could say, it was perfect. Now, I wouldn't say it's the perfect game because I don't know what the perfect game is. But there's nothing that I would change in the game. So yeah, there's lots of games out there where, you know, there's nothing that I would change about it. When is the Gaming Rules Big Book of Groganized House Rules coming out? Soon, TM. Don't know when. <laughs> um, we'll get to the end of Adam's questions and then we're going to do the contest. I'll announce the contest. Right, Adam says, in your opinion, what's the next big theme that is on the horizon uh, or a theme that I would personally like to see. Now, I think I've been asked this question a few times before. I don't mind people asking it again, but I think my answer last time was I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what the next big theme will be. You know, Mars was popular a few years ago and kind of still is now. Uh, who knows? I, I, I don't know what the next big popular theme will be that everybody will suddenly jump on the bandwagon and, you know, try and create a game on. A theme that I would personally like to see, again, I think I got asked this before and I think I wasn't sure um, what. I, I think I did remark that I like the fact that a lot of games are coming out with uh, themes which tend to be based on more uh, real stuff. So things happening in real life, um, you know, more games like that that people can associate with. What game would I like to see the official deluxe collector's version of with all brand new sparkly pieces and why? So I've had to think about this and I basically I need more time to think about it. But what I'm going to do, I mentioned earlier on my BGG guild. So I am going to post a new thread on my BGG guild later today, probably just after this if I remember. And I'm going to put that question to the guild. So if you have your own thoughts on uh, what game that you think should be uh, should have a deluxe, I can't really say deluxified because I think that's trademarked and Tasty Mineral Games. But anyway, a, a game that has a new deluxe version with brand new, you know, blinged out components. I will start a thread on my BGG Guild and you can post there and put your own answers in. And then when I manage to think of something, I'll put it in there as well. Uh, Adam also wants to know, after the tragic loss of UK Games Expo, yep, yeah, it was announced this week that UK Games Expo this year is now officially cancelled. They've moved it back to August but they have now cancelled it for this year. Is Gridcon sadly having to follow suit? We need to speak to the hotel again this week. Uh, Gridcon is my own convention that I run. It's 200 people. It's in Tiverton, which is in Somerset uh, in the UK. Is it in Somerset? It's not in Somerset. Where is it? Is it Devon? Oh, okay, it's in Devon. Why did I think it was Somerset? That's Taunton that's in Somerset. Right, okay, it's in Devon. Um, and it's supposed to be happening at the end of June. Now, the hotel is still confident when we last spoke to them that the hotel is going to be open in June and therefore hosting my convention there at the end of June. It's, it's potentially still going to happen. Um, we're not sure yet. So, yeah, who knows? Um, watch this space. I will let you know. Is there any games that you have parted with over the years and you now miss and why? So this is another question from Adam. Adam's asked a few questions today, which is fine. So I rarely get rid of games because... I quite often have people over and I like the fact that I've got a fairly large games collection that people could come round, see the collection and go, oh, I quite fancy playing that. 
So even games which I've got which I might not play again, I might not move on. The only ones I generally move on, or used to, are ones where I either don't like the game or I say, look, I don't really want this anymore, I don't think it's that good, whatever, and I move it on. Recently, I've had to start moving more games, I've had to lower the bar a little bit, um, but what I'm doing is I'm doing Patreon giveaways, and last year at Gridcon, Gridcon 1, I put loads of my games into a charity raffle, so that, that helped that, um, raise some money for charity. Um, Vicky is saying I need to move more on. Yes, because <laughs> the games are spreading out into other rooms and the attic and the garage and in here and yeah, got got, got slightly too many. Um, so yeah, I don't like moving games on, but as I say, I've had to. Now, is there any games that I've moved on that I then regret? I had to think about this and there was a couple that sprung to mind, but then I thought, no, actually, um, I probably, probably wouldn't, because even if I'm thinking now, oh no, maybe I will play that again, I've got 500 other games that I think are much better, with better rule books, and it's like, yeah, so I, I won't bother. What game from your younger days would be remade into an awesome board game today, and why, and what tweaks would it need? So I've mentioned a few times on various streams uh, and whatever that when I was growing up, I played a game called Spy Ring, which came out in the 70s. I don't remember that much about it, apart from it was spy themed, you were moving around a board, and you put little antennas in your, in your heads and you had to radio the other person. That's all I remember about it. But if Spy Ring was updated into a more modern game, that would be great. Is there ever a great movie that has successfully been ported into a game? Now, I'm going to ask this question to people in the chat. If you know of, well, a movie or a TV show. So movies and TV shows that have been turned into board games that were good, please let us know. Okay, post your comments in the chat now. I will see them, or Vicky will see them and tell me. Um, so yeah, let, let me know. Um, I've heard people say Nemesis is quite good, which is basically based on Aliens, the film. Um, I've not played it myself, and I'm not sure I would like it. I know a lot of people have said, oh, Paul, you should try it. Four hours, semi-co-op, player el elimination. Not sure that's my kind of thing, really. Um, so yeah, but I'm sure there's been others. People have said that the Expanse board game is quite good, although some other people have said it's not so good. Um, I'm not sure. But yeah, list in the chat your favourite TV shows, movies that have been turned into board games um, that have been good. Adam also wants to know if I prefer cake or pie, and this is a really difficult decision because I love cake, but I also love pie because I like pastry. Um, if you had to give me a choice of cake or pie, I'd probably go pie just... Um, because pie could be savoury or sweet, and therefore I get best of both worlds. So I do like a good pie, you know, chicken, mushroom, chicken, vegetable, whatever. Sweet stuff, uh, cherry, apple, pear, anything like that, really. Um, Vicky's saying comments on the chat about TV shows. Right, so we're saying Vengeance is based on revenge movies. Okay. Uh, so non-specific, but just revenge movies. Okay. About Star Galactica, of course. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Battlestar Galactica is an absolutely fantastic game, and that is based on TV series. Uh, Paul is saying that The Expanse is good. Um, Pi is the right answer. Thunderbirds. Was Thunderbirds a good game? I haven't played it, but I heard mixed things about it. Um, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Yeah. Uh, and, and I liked that, sort of. There were bits about it that I liked, but then there were a bit of problems. Uh, Star Wars Rebellion which is not just from one movie, but it's from the, the, the whole Star Wars genre. Uh, and Rhubarb Pie. I, d I don't remember that film. Is that a film? No. Anyway, Firefly. Dina says Firefly. Now, yeah, Firefly, amazing TV series. I would never want to play the board game of Firefly. I know some people like it, but it just, for me, it's very, very long and it seems very, very random. And I, I don't really enjoy that. Sons of Anarchy is a very cool IP game. Yes, Paolo, thank you very much for joining in. I had heard Sons of Anarchy was actually a pretty good game. Um, so yeah, so there's a few of them. Right. Oh, Homeland, Marvel Champions. Yeah, I was going to say Marvel Champions. Well, Marvel. Marvel Champions. But then, I mean, yeah, that's based on a whole movie franchise. So yeah, Marvel Champions is fantastic. Right, keep them going. I'm going to move on to the next question. No, I'm going to do the contest. Right, so every month, during this live Q&A, uh, Games Law basically give me 
well, they don't give it to me, but they give somebody £25 worth of game vouchers. So if you are watching this live, uh, and in fact, I'm going to extend it because I used to do it live, but I'm probably going to extend it. So if you're watching this either live or you watch this tonight, then please drop me an email. Paul.grogan at Outlook.com. And you need to put, and I've chosen today that the code word is Fort Walla Walla, which is a real place, apparently. But this is in America. This is part of the game board for Mini Express, which is a game that I played this afternoon. Uh, that is on the channel now, if you want to go watching it. So yeah, Fort Walla Walla. Send me an email with that. If you are a patron supporter, please put that in the email as well, and you'll get you'll basically get two entries into the hat. Tomorrow morning, I will do a draw out of the hat. So as long as you've watched, as long as you've sent me an email before eight o'clock tomorrow morning, um, then yeah, I'll do the draw, and the lucky winner will get twenty five pounds worth of vouchers from Games Law. And if you're not in the UK, you can still enter um, and we can sort something out. I can get the game to you somehow. Right, moving on. Question from Ray. What are you planning to do now that Expo has been cancelled? So at Expo for the last mm, five, six years, I run the CGE booth. So the Czech Games Edition booth at Expo is my responsibility. I book the space, get the demo staff, although Ben does a lot of that for me. Um, and we do demos of all of the new CGE games and some old ones. Now that UK Games Expo has been cancelled, I have a meeting with CGE next week and I have a plan. And here's what I've offered to do. I have offered to spend three days, the three days that would have been UK Games Expo, sitting at home and doing online games, teaching people the new games. They've got some games coming out this year. We would have prototypes of those games at Expo where we would be teaching people how to play them. If we can get online tools for those games and those online tools are already there because we're using them to play test right now if they allow me to make those online things public i can basically do i can still run what i would normally do at games expo um, and invite people in teach them how to play the game online and they can play it and they can see the game ahead of time that's what i'm planning to do cge needs to obviously allow that to happen but hopefully we'll see in fact drop them an email and say with the UK Games Expo uncancelled, how can I see your new games this year? Um, right, question in from Rick. So this is, if there was to be a Paul Grogan Arkham Horror Living Card Game uh, Investigator card, what class would I be and what stats would I have? Right. <laughs> well, definitely Seeker, um, because that's the one that I kind of want to play in the game. I'm not really a combat -y person. I'm not really a rogue type character. So going around and investigating, I think he's, he's definitely more my kind of thing. Of course, I'd love to have magic spells if I could, uh, but I don't. As for my stats, my willpower is quite low. My combat ability is non-existent. Uh, I keep tripping over things. So I would have to probably say intellect would be possibly a three and the rest of them would be pretty low. Question in from Gareth. What is it that you get from gaming? And does the medium, physical or digital, change that? That is a really good question. What is it that I get from gaming is not something that I can sum up um, briefly. It's, it's why do I enjoy gaming? Um, I like I like the intellectual challenge. I like the I like the thought process and the decision making. It's like sort of solving a puzzle, and I like puzzle games. Um, it's kind of like right. Well, I need to do this, and I need to do that. How am I going to do that? And you kind of work through it. Um, there is the social aspect of the game, and I do like having friends around and, and playing games with them. There is that, um, which is why I prefer multiplayer games to solo games. Does Has the medium changed it? And it's interesting because I haven't really played live online games with anybody for years. And I'm sure I have at some point in the past, but right now I'm doing a lot of it. And I'm really enjoying it. Um, oh, that sounds like a cat. Yeah, we've been joined by Kat. Come here, Loki. Where's he going up on you? Um, so it hasn't really changed it. Um, obviously, people are not coming round. They're not sitting at the same table as me. We're not, we're not having that. But I'm talking to them over Skype. I'm seeing them while I'm playing the game. And then afterwards, we just say, thanks very much for the game, click, and they're done. And I've been thinking that once the current crisis that we're in is over, how is this going to change my life moving forward? And I think it actually is. 
because I think I'm going to start using these online tools more. Um, it's not to say I'm not going to have people around to play games, but I think it's going to give me the opportunity to play more games, which I wouldn't normally have. Um, and it, it, it's the fact that we can say, oh, is anybody available for a game online? Yeah, right, well, let's play a game. So it, it, without any form of planning or anything like that, um, the patron supporters on my Slack channel, they're, they're arranging online games against each other on a regular basis. And it just means whoever's free, we can drop in, we can play a game that we all want to play, and then we're done. And then nobody has to go up, nobody has to go anywhere. And in the last few weeks, I've been playing a game, I've been playing games with people, you know, um, Israel, Kuwait, uh, all around Europe, over in America. I mean, the, the game of Mini Express that we had this afternoon, I was in the UK, two people were in America, one person was in Taiwan, and another person was in Australia. And we did that. We did that today and I, we wouldn't have been able to do that any other way. So the fact that this this uh, virus is uh, obviously what's going on in the world, the crisis, the lockdown, it's actually making us have to use online tools to play games. But I don't think I'm actually losing any of the enjoyment I get from playing games because of it. So there you go. Bit of a long winded answer, but that's it. Ray wants to know what have I been up to that isn't board gaming. So we've been watching TV. Uh, we've started watching season three of Arrow because we watched season one and two and enjoyed them years ago. And we've started watching season three. We've started watching some Red Dwarfs, uh, the, the recent series of Red Dwarfs that we haven't watched. Uh, we've been watching a few films as well. Um, we've still got some old Big Bang theories to catch up on. So yeah, we've been watching quite a bit of TV while I'm putting games away downstairs. I haven't been doing much painting in the last couple of weeks. I've had a painting spree over the last few months but in the last two weeks i haven't done any painting because i've been sat downstairs with the laptop uh doing other stuff instead so yeah i do need to get back into painting but that that's kind of been put aside for for the moment and we've also both me and vicky recently have found we found a number of apps uh freely available puzzle games on the ipad if you're interested in them please let me know, drop me a message on Slack or however, and we can let you know what they are. And they're totally free to play. And the ones that we've been playing recently have been really, really good. The puzzles have been clever uh, and we're both kind of roughly doing it at the same time. So if either of us gets stuck on a puzzle, we can help each other out. So we've been doing a lot of them. Um, Harold wants to know, he's, he's watched my Cloud Spire videos and you back to the game. Well, as long as it helped you decide whether um, it would be a game you like, then that's good. Uh, can't really say know exactly what we're doing. Uh, are there any plans to do a few full tutorial video of the base game? I don't. I don't have any plans to do an actual how to play video for Cloudspire. If Chip Theory Games ever wanted me to do one, I would love to do one. Um, they have done their own series of tutorials, so they might think that that's probably enough. I have watched those videos myself. Shannon has done them and they are really good. So I don't know whether there's a need for them to basically, you know, commission a third party to do them. Mine would be a different style if I did them, but they've already got their own ones online. Um, and Harold is also saying that Cloudspire is by far the most expensive game. With some Euro games that are now close to 100 euros, do I see a trend of games getting more expensive with, of course, high quality components? Or is it just Harold who is following the high end designers and publishers? Now, I have thoughts on this because there are a number of games that come out where the price tag is $100, $120, $140, whatever. You've got Frosthaven, you've got Cloudspire. Um, there's other ones as well that are coming out and you see them. They're on Kickstarter and they're really expensive. But when you look at a game like Cloudspire or Frosthaven and you look at the amount of components that you get in there, and I'm not just saying you're paying a lot of money for components, but the good quality components Chip Theory games have awesome quality, which is why the games are expensive to make, which is why they could never go to retail with them because their margins are actually not very high. You know, if, if you're a publisher and you're going to retail, you're going to get 40% of RRP from the distributor. And then the distributor will then get 20% of the RRP for themselves and it goes to retail. And then the retailer gets the remaining 40%, although the most of them discount it by 10 to 20%. That's kind of how it works. So if Cloudspire went to retail, if it's $120, a distributor would only pay Chip Theory Games whatever 40% of $120 is, $48. It costs them more than $48 to make the game. Therefore, they can't. They can't really ever go to retail. So you've got that aspect of it. 
The other aspect of it is that there are, you know, normal Euro games, so not your big box massive affairs coming out and the price seems to have crept up on them. And whilst those games are very good games, and I'm not going to name any in particular, but I've seen some Euro games coming out last year for 60, 70, 80 euros, and they're good games. However, when you compare them to the amount of stuff that you get, you know, in these other massive games, I'm thinking, hmm, they seem to be a little overpriced. Now, I don't want to go into detail because obviously I work in the industry, but I think there is an element of some publishers might be thinking, oh, we could get this for that, so let's put it at that. And they may be making more money than some other publishers. It's weird because you still see some games coming out from some publishers where you go, all oh, right, that's 50 euros. Well, that seems expensive, but you know, you get a lot. And then you see another game coming out from another publisher at 60 euros where you don't get anywhere near as much stuff. And it's like, hmm. Anyway, that is it from all of the questions from the BGG Guild. So thank you very much to everybody for asking those questions in advance because I was able to read through them. I'm now going to go through the questions that I've been asked on the UK on Board Game Trading Chat UK Facebook group. I will get to everybody else's questions. Are you adding them in? Contest. Contest. Mention. Yeah, mention the contest again. Send me an email. Fort Walla Walla. If you're a Patreon supporter, say that. And as long as you send me an email before eight o'clock tomorrow morning, I will do the draw and you can win £25 worth of games vouchers. Thank you very much to Games Law for sponsoring the show. Right, first questions are from James Kenny. Thank you very much, James. If you could play any game with any world leader, past or present, what game would it be and who with? Uh, which is a fantastic question and I, I don't know. Um, I was thinking of the leaders from through the ages really, but then I thought, well, no, why, why think about that? Because half of them weren't actually leaders. Um, I think that's another question that I'm gonna put on my BGG Guild and I'm gonna open it up to everybody. So again, on my BGG Guild, Guild number 2258, if you're not a member of it, Go on BGG, join up. Uh, it's boardgamegeek.com slash guild slash 2258. Join it, subscribe, and then you will get a notification. And I'm actually going to put that question on the guild because it's a really good question. So that's, if you could play a game with any world leader, past or present, what game would it be and who with? James also wants to know is that if I had to live somewhere other than Columpton, where would it be? Well, somewhere with... Possibly nicer weather um, is all I can think of. I mean, I, I do like Columpton. I tend to settle wherever I live. So I'm living in Columpton, so Columpton's my home and I'm, and I'm happy with it. Um, if given the choice, I'd probably go somewhere with a lot more natural scenery. So mountains, forests, somewhere like that. Um, I know some of my Patreon supporters post photos from where they are uh, and where they live. Um, and I'm quite envious sometimes, not not in a bad way, but you know, jealous. The, well, that's still, still bad. Um, you know, you see photos of nice mountains and lakes and trees. Uh, that that would be nice. But you know, whether they have a a post office at the end of the road and a and a Tesco just five minutes walk away, you know, it's all all about balance. Um, if you had to live in any game themed universe or location, where would it be? Oh, I should have looked at that question beforehand. That's a really good one. If I had to live in a game themed universe, a, a game that I know and that I like, and I would have to live in it, I'll have a think about that while we're answering the other questions. Or if anybody's got any suggestions, where would I like to live? That's, that's a really good question. Right, okay, Joe Solo, here's a question. Rolling a d6 as opposed to any, no, any other numerically faced die, e.g. a d4 or a d20, during a game, has a randomness that sits comfortably with him, okay? What are your views on using dice in games? Does there always need to be a mechanism for mitigating the dice roll? And also, what numerical dice best suits board games? If not D6, then which one? Okay, so my general opinion on dice is that dice for resolution is not a thing that I generally like in games, generally. There's a few games that I play that have dice for resolution or the equivalent, and I do enjoy them. But when it's a Euro game, uh, generally a competitive Euro game, I don't like dice for resolution. What I'm happy with is the dice are rolled and then decisions are made based on the results of the dice. So the dice are rolled first and they're either drafted or something like that. And dice have been used a lot in a lot of games over the last 
you know, five years, a lot of Stefan Feld games use dice. Uh, Legrand uses dice. A lot of games. Um, I'm thinking uh, Signorie from Watch Your Game. All dice drafting games, things like that. So you know, you roll the dice and lay them out, and then oh, you've got to try and work out what you want to do based on the dice. That's fine. Castles of Burgundy, you know, things like that. That's fine. Dice for resolution without mitigation. I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, even in Nemo's War that I've been playing a lot of recently, that has dice rolls for everything. It is just dice rolls nonstop. But there are ways that you can influence the dice rolls. Now, I always like it when games you can influence the dice rolls after you've rolled them. Because in trying to influence them beforehand, so like, you know, in Nemo's War, when you're trying to incite a, a revolt, if you want to, you can spend treasure. And if you spend treasure beforehand, it will add to your dice roll and then you roll. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're increasing the odds of it being successful. The problem with that, and this is one thing that I do find frustrating, Nemo's War is a solo game, so it's fine. But in a competitive game, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to spend this jewellery, right? This, is, this was worth four points to me. But I'm going to spend it because I, I want this to work. Okay, so I've spent it. I've just lost four points. And then you roll, and you roll a double six or a double one, and you've failed. So not only have you failed, you've also lost the four points. Conversely, if you roll a double six, you're like, oh, well, I, I would have succeeded anyway. So I've actually just lost four points. Basically, that's just massively random. And I, do, I don't like that in games. Now, as I say, there are some games that I do play which have dice for resolution. The Arkham Horror Living Card game isn't dice for resolution, but you're drawing a chit out of a bag and it's essentially the same thing. I enjoy that, but it's a cooperative game and that's, that's the big difference. Uh, right, so going back to comments about the board game world to live in. Uh, small world, would I like to live in? I, I wouldn't, but if Adam would, then that, that's fine. Uh, John says Magic the Gathering for your living place. Would I like to live in the world of Magic the Gathering? It's lost the emoticons. It's lost the emoticons, yes. right, okay. Um, Rick says, Beasts of Balance. Is that is that a game world? Um, <laughs> uh, Adam says, we could live in the pandemic game world. Oh, wait, yeah. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, uh, a world rich in theme, like something like Arkham Horror. Would I like to live in the world of Arkham Horror, probably not because it's very scary. Um, would I like to live in the Mage Knight universe? Well, if I was a Mage Knight, possibly. Um, you yeah, know, things like that. Right, Leanne says, what game with hexes do you think would be better without and vice versa? Hmm, there are some games with hexes where the actual hex grid makes it, I mean, I generally prefer hex grids to squares, but the hex grid, you end up with some weird situations like half hexes and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, games that I've designed in the past, I would generally either go with hexes or I'd go with squares, but allow you to move to any of the eight directions. Each one has its advantage. I'm not sure about that. What game that has hexes do I think would be better without? The first time I read that question, I thought, oh, I'm sure I can think of one, but I can't now. Do you think it's possible to have a complex game that's language neutral, or do you feel <clears throat> that in-game text is intrinsic to a certain level of gaming? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, so the first thing is, you can have a complex game that doesn't have any language text on cards. Um, got something in my throat. <clears throat> so yeah, you can, have, you can have very complex games without any text on cards. You can have that. Um, just lots and lots and lots of icons. Um, so yeah, is in-game text intrinsic to a certain level of gaming? No, I don't think it is. I think, I think there are simple games with text on cards and I think there are complex games with text on cards. But also there are complex games without text on cards. I can't think of any offhand, but I think there are. Why do I play purple? Because it's the best colour. Scientific fact, um, not opinion. Um, on Mars is language neutral. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, comment in the chat. On Mars is language neutral. Very, very complex game. No text on cards anywhere. Yeah, just icons. What themed game would you likely never be interested in playing? I'm not sure who sent this question. Was this was this in the chat from earlier? That's Leanne. Oh, that's Leanne as well. Okay, what themed game would you never be interested in playing? And conversely, is there a theme that you would always fancy a shot at? I, I would play most games. There are certain 
there are certain themes that I definitely would not want to play, but they are probably the ones that most other people would want to play. Um, so if you were a mob boss and your job was to go around and killing people or whatever, I'm not interested in that. Um, any games with kind of disturbing or sickening themes, I wouldn't want to play. Uh, a game like This War of Mine, would I play that? Yeah. I mean, that's a harrowing, awful experience, but I'm not put off by the theme in, in that game. I, I would play that game. But yeah, there are certain ones that I wouldn't play. Uh, thankfully, those games generally don't, don't exist. Uh, Rick is asking me, what is my favourite role-playing game? Now, that's another really good question. And it's interesting because I played role-playing games from like 83. And I, I stopped playing role-playing games. When did we move down to Devon or Somerset? 2007. So I stopped playing role-playing games in 2007. Because I, be, prior to moving to Somerset, I actually ran two weekly D&D groups. So I played D&D as a system for about 20 odd years. I've played a number of different role-playing games. I wouldn't say D&D was my favourite at all. In fact, my favourite is one that I only ever played once. And I say it's my favourite, having only played it once, because I like the setting and that Shadowrun. And if I got the opportunity to play Shadowrun properly, with a good GM and a good, you know, a good, a good environment, I'd love to play Shadowrun. Shadowrun is modern day, but magic exists. So it's a combination of fantasy with trolls, goblins, orcs, magic and everything else, but set in a modern day environment with guns, cars, computers and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I have read a few Shadowrun source books and it just, yeah, it's, it's a really, really good setting. I'd really love to play more games. Uh, yeah, I'd love to play Shadowrun, basically. And Kevin says, which video editing software do I use? I, I have the Adobe Creative Suite, so I use the Adobe Premiere for all of the video editing and I use a combination of After Effects and Photoshop for all of the, all of the other stuff. Right, there we go. We are up to date with all of the questions that I've been asked in advance. So thank you very much for bearing with me. Uh, a little quick break just to mention the contest again. If you're just tuning in, you have until eight o'clock tomorrow morning, UK time, to send me an email, paul.grogan at outlook.com. Uh, the, the, the password or whatever is Fort Walla Walla. Just put that. And if you're a patron supporter, mention that and I will put you into the entries twice. One lucky winner will win £25 worth of game vouchers. Scott Hill won last month. I don't know what he's done with it yet. He's probably bought some socks. Um, but yeah, let me know, Scott, what you decide to spend your money on in the end. Right, so now we're going to go through the questions that people have been asking in the chat. And feel free to keep asking them. And Vicky is adding them to the end of a Google document. So I can't actually see the chat myself. Do we have a cat? I thought I heard a cat. Right. So uh, the question is from Richard from We're Not Wizards Tabletop Podcast. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much for asking. What equipment am I using to record videos? Well, I have lots of bits of equipment. Uh, right now, the camera that I am recording this on, so the camera that's looking at me right now, was 80 quid from eBay, okay, about two years ago. It is a seven-year-old Panasonic camcorder. Um, it's got a HDMI lead in the side. That is going to what's called an Elgato... What's it called? Elgato Link something or other. It's a little USB thingy, what's it, that goes into the computer, okay? So that's the, that's the physical equipment. I also have a couple of webcams that I use when I'm streaming computer games. So the webcams are looking at me. These are Logitech C920s, the standard one that everybody seems to use. My overhead camera is a, is a new one. So the overhead camera is the one that I did spend the money on. That was about a thousand pound. It's a Sony AX1000. So that's mounted into the ceiling. It's a 4K camera. That's what I use for this. And then I've got another Panasonic camera, which I, which is the one that I thought had broken. Turns out it was the cable. Um, but that's that used to be used as well when I had, um, when I was filming the playthroughs here, I needed three cameras. Right now I don't need three cameras. So I've just got that one on there. Um, but yeah, people who think you need, you know, lots of expensive equipment to do it. The camera that you're seeing me on now was 80 quid. Uh, and the Elgato Link thing was about 60 quid or something like that. So it's not that expensive. Um, I hope that helps. Um, oh, Scott is saying he's still trying to decide. Everything that you want to buy is, still, is out of stock. <laughs> out of stock. Um, so Jason, Lone Jedi 70, Fighter Fred. So the reason I've got this in the background is I wanted to give Jason a boost. Jason is a really, really great guy. 
I met him through my work at Czech Games Edition. Jason is the guy who writes all of CGE's rule books. Okay, now Jason and Vlaja go years back. Jason used to live in the Czech Republic. Um, he met Vlaja. He's, Jason is a super nice guy. Um, he's got an amazing sense of humor. He's, he's very, very similar to Vlaja's sense of humor. Um, and Jason lives over in America on a ranch in Montana. And he's an author. That, that's what he does. He's a writer. And he has written a number of books. And he's written some fantasy books. He's written Fighter Fred. There's three of them in the series. That is book one. Um, he kindly gave me a copy of them, which I brought them back. I've not read them myself. Vicky has just finished book two. Thumbs up. Thumbs up from Vicky. Um, obviously, you can see the style of the artwork. It's very similar to the uh, the 70s Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's very, what's the word you used? Clichéd. In, in a good way. All of the things that are cliche about a role-playing game, like the adventurers meeting in a bar, the fighter fighting, and things like that. Uh, tropes, fantasy trope things. All of those things that you would expect to find in it, that's exactly what it is. Um, but if you like Jason's style of humour from reading any of the CGE books, uh, he also wrote the Galaxy Trucker novel as well. So, yeah, which is also really good. So, yeah, there you go. Fighter Fred, he's done three of them. Uh, we've got the first two. Matthew Palmer says, what are your thoughts on making up your own Mage Knight scenarios? What are your thoughts on making up one's own Mage Knight scenarios? Well, my thoughts on you making them up or, or me making them up? Um, if you want to make up your own Mage Knight scenarios, go for it. Definitely. If, that, if that's what you mean, I'm, I'm more than happy for people to make up their own scenarios. I certainly had quite a lot of fun uh, making the Mage Knight scenarios. I don't want to do it again. I've done that now. It was a lot of work. Now, if you're making your own scenarios for any game and you're going to publish them just as a fan-based scenario and you're going to put them online or anything like that, just do it. People will play it. And if it doesn't work, if it's broken or unbalanced or whatever, people will tell you. The reason why I said fun in quotes is that the ones I did for Mage Knight were being published. And this is like, you know, a massively popular game. And if I'd have made scenarios that were broken and didn't work and they got published, that's bad. That's really bad. So it, it was very, very nerve wracking. And I ended up doing dozens and dozens and dozens of hours of playtesting and get lots of people involved. Um, yeah, financially, it really wasn't worth it. Um, but, you know, it was a good experience to do it. And I'm pleased to say, you know, there, there's there's expansions that I designed that have been published for Mage Knight. But yeah, if you want to do it, definitely do it. And as I say, just don't overthink it yourself. Put it on BGG, get other people to play it uh, and see what they think. Uh, oh, this is in response to me talking about demoing CGE games. Oh, is this Paolo's question? So, uh, right, okay, so Paolo's question, have I used the new tournament web support for Through the Ages? So Paolo, I don't know if you were here at the start of the, of the live Q&A, but uh, John Dunnett, one of my patron supporters, um, has or just organized uh, a 16 player gaming rules patron supporters Through the Ages tournament. Um, and he's happy to do another one. So I haven't used it yet, but literally I'm about to start using it because I think my first game might be starting very soon. So yeah, I, I haven't used it, but I'm going to be soon. Scott is saying, am I aware that Asmodee are taking down tabletop simulator mods of their games and do I have any thoughts on it? Yes, I have thoughts on it. And I've been involved in a Twitter conversation this afternoon about it. I have thoughts on it. First of all, having mods on tabletop simulator for certain games is infringing their copyright. That's a fact. People have scanned in cards and have made those and have created the mods and have made those games available to public to play that's not legal, okay? They're not allowed to do that. But it happens, right? It's been happening for a very, very long time. And they haven't really clamped down on it before. And I fully support any publisher whose games are, the copyright is being infringed. I fully support them to take whatever steps they need to take to take these games down. Will I be affected by that? Will I be able to play games that you know, will I will I no longer be able to play games that I maybe want to play? Yeah, absolutely fine. Should I be able to play those games for free online without buying them? No, I shouldn't, right? However, doing it now, I have an issue with that, okay? And if anybody from Asmodee is watching this, then I'm sorry, but right now, 
People are stuck at home. There's a global crisis going on. People want to play these games online. And I know they're infringing your copyright. They've been doing it for years, OK? Those games have been on Tabletop Simulator for one, two, three years. Closing them down now, that's what I have issues with. Leave them there for a month. Leave them there for two months, then take them down, OK? Just let people right now play those games online and then take them down. But doing it right now, yeah, I have issues with that. Sorry, I'm getting all angry about it. Um, so Paolo would like to enter the Through the Ages tournament, but you don't use Slack. That's fine. Drop me an email. I will pass your email on to John. John is going to start another tournament for another 16 people. Um, so yeah, just drop me an email and I can, I can pass it on. Uh, Adam is saying, do I think my local friendly game shops and board game cap cafes will be able to survive this? That's interesting. Um, so the local friendly game shops, um, Meeple's Corner in Crediton, um, I would probably say is my local friendly game store. I don't go to it because it's 45 minutes drive away and I don't have a car. Um, but also I don't, I don't generally buy games these days from stores. Um, am I, are they going to be able to survive this? I think they will. And the reason why I'm saying that is because Christoph, who runs Meeple's Corner, probably does most of his business mail order, okay? He does have a, an actual physical store, and I'm sure some people do go in, but the people who go in and would buy a game will just buy from him online. So I think he's going to be okay. Board game cafes is a very good question. I don't know. Now, I'm friends with the people who run Chance Encounters up in Bristol. I might drop them a message after this and just see how they're doing, because you're right, how can they afford to carry on? I guess... Vicky might be able to help with this. If a board game cafe, would it be classified as all of the staff being furloughed? It's up to them. But they could. Okay, so a board game cafe could furlough all of the staff and they would get 80% of their salary. It's just the rent for the building and I think they can get some kind of overheads and things like that. So I think they'll be fine. Um, yeah. Kabuki Kid, what is the game that you put, put the most money into? Maybe both a single game and also a game system or line. How about, get, how about a game you pimped out some? So probably, uh, and, and bearing in mind that I am a media content creator, so I do get some stuff passed to me from publishers and I don't have to buy them myself. The game, if, assuming I had to buy all of the games that I have in my collection, Probably the one that's cost me the most money would be the Arkham Horror card game because I've got almost everything for it. You're talking probably, what, 300, 400 pounds, 450 pounds, something like that. So, yeah, I mean, that's not one single game. Technically it is, but, you know, it's not. Te te technically it's not, but some people might think it is. Um, the other game that I've, I mean, Roads and Boats was expensive, which I bought with my own money. That was like 120 pounds or something like that. Um, obviously Frosthaven when that arrives, Gloomhaven when, Gloomhaven, you know, I, I actually bought Gloomhaven when it was first on Kickstarter, $79 or delivered or something crazy. Um, yeah, so yeah, probably the Arkham Horror card game is the one that if I'd have bought all of the stuff that I have for it, probably would have cost the most. Um, in response to the Asmodee taking the games down, so Kabuki Kid says, you can see why lots of companies will let them go digital without their permission because it gives their exposure and play. Yeah, and this afternoon, I have had a very brief Twitter chat um, with, um, who was it? <laughs> Sammy, that's it, Sammy from, I can't remember the name of the, of the company, so I am gonna look it up very quickly now because I can't even remember the name. Oh, this is, this is gonna be embarrassing. I've got a story to tell you, and I can't actually remember are you laughing? I can't remember the name of the game or the name of the publisher or anything. And I was, right, here we go. Dale of Merchants. Right, that's it. Dale of Merchants is the game. Sammy is the guy. At least I remembered his name. And the company Snowdale Design. I've had a lot going on today. Dale of Merchants, with all of the expansions, is available on Tabletop Simulator. And Sammy, from the publisher, has mentioned that and has tweeted about it and everything. Dale of Merchants is a game which I have been... I have heard so many people say he's really good and I've never had the opportunity to play it. And Sammy reached out to me on Twitter and said, Paul, it's on Tabletop Simulator. If you want me to teach you how to play it sometime, hop on and we'll do it. 
So I've gone back to him and I said, well, do you want to do it as a live stream? So all of a sudden, I might be doing a live stream of me playing Dale of Merchants with the designer of the game actually teaching me how to play and I might be, I might be streaming it. I'm going to send him a message this evening and see if he wants to do it. That is a publisher supporting their community. Okay, now obviously there will be some people that go online and play that and then don't buy the physical game because of it. But I just think that kind of support right now is what we need and not what Asmodee are doing. Right, okay, where's that document gone? <laughs> it's there. Um, uh, so Ray, what is the weirdest place you've played a board game? Oh. Well, weird. We played the Settlers of Catan card game on a cruise ship. I mean, I've not really played a game in a weird place, like, you know, in a cave or up a tree or something like that. So, yeah, probably probably that. We we played that on a cruise on a on a cruise ship. Have I played a game on a plane? I've played through the ages on the app <laughs> on a plane, but that doesn't really count, does it? Yeah, we've done some puzzle books, but they don't really count. In terms of board game, it's probably that. That's all I can think of. It's not very weird, but it's unusual. Uh, do I have a favourite mug? That's a good question. I've got a few. Yeah, whenever I go downstairs and get, get a drink, I, there's, a, there's a few mugs that I quite like. I'm not sure which one my favourite one would be. It's probably the Statue of Liberty one. Do you want to get it? Yeah, so when I was in America in... I think, was it 99? Yeah, I think I went to America in 99. And I went to New York for a few days and we went up the Statue of Liberty. Um, and there was a Statue of Liberty mug that I could uh, that you can buy. Uh, and it's just, it's a really good quality mug. It was probably quite expensive. Um, but yeah, really, really good quality mug. That's probably one of my favourites. Um, I do also like the one that I got from TowerCon many, many, many years ago where we entered a pub quiz and came last. So I've got a, a bright red mug that says you are the lowest squire on it. So that's because there's a bit of history behind that. Um, and I think Vicky's here with, here we go. So yeah, it's a Statue of Liberty cup. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's just a really nice place. It's nothing to do with the fact that it's Statue of Liberty really. It's just, it's a good quality mug. So there we go. Right. Uh, Adam, top three games on your list of want to play but haven't list. Oh, I'd have to think about that. <laughs> um, games that I want to play that I haven't yet played. Well, Dale of Merchants, we can add that to the list. <laughs> um, there's a lot. I, yeah, there, there is definitely a lot. I don't know what my top three is. And again, with Tabletop Simulator, right now with all of the games that are on there, I'm scrolling down that list and I'm finding... I still haven't played Star Wars Rebellion but I'm not going to be able to use Tabletop Simulator for that, again, which is fair enough. If I want to play it, I should go and buy it. Um, the Crusaders game from Tasty Minstrel Games, I've heard good things about that and want to play that. There's loads. There's absolutely loads of games that I haven't played yet that I want to play. Quite, quite, um, yeah, quite a lot. Tom, Tom's in bright red. Yeah. Why, why have you, why have you bright redded Tom? Oh, now you've, I can't read it now. Right, okay. Uh, so Tom D says, Chick Theory Games have given their blessing to play games on Tabletop Simulator. Right. However, they are not responsible for the mod itself. So this is going back again. So there is a Cloud Spire mod and a Too Many Bones mod on Tabletop Simulator, which have been created by fans, again, who scanned in all of the cards themselves, did it all themselves, and Chick Theory Games have given their blessing. So they've said, if you want to play our games on that, you can. That's fine. Um, Vitruvian Gamer is here. Hello, thank you for joining in. Got those issues for your stream solved. Yeah, that was that was yesterday. There's always some kind of issue and that one was just, yeah, just a glitch that I was getting. I really wish I could help you more with your streaming. And if you want to speak to me privately, you can. But to be honest, I've, I've no idea. <laughs> I don't know if I can help you out. Um, but I would love to if I could. Um, basically, he's trying to do live streaming like me, but when he when he, he's got a good internet connection, but when he goes into YouTube, it says it's not receiving enough data. Um, and I, you know, just, it could be to do with the stream ingest service settings. I don't know. I've just used the default, so I don't really know about it. I would love to help if I could. Uh, Andrew says, I may still find to take part in the Frosthaven giveaway. So yes, you are. So every month, um, 
I do a giveaway through my Patreon campaign. And it is currently the 29th of April. And tomorrow is the last day of the month. So here's how my monthly giveaways go. If you are a patron supporter of mine at producer level or higher, you are automatically entered into the contest. You don't need to do anything. You don't send me an email. You don't fill in a form, nothing like I do a number of giveaways. I did one at the start of the week where you had to fill in a form. I'm doing one today where you need to drop me an email. But the big one this month is for a full pledge of, of Frosthaven, which is worth $240 and it contains everything. You can go onto the Kickstarter page now and you can see what you actually get. Um, and that is being given away to one of my patron supporters and I will be doing the draw in two days time. And the way that you enter is by supporting me on Patreon, okay? A lot of the content that I make, I think it's probably about 60, 70% of the content that I'm making at the moment, maybe, is not, is not, is not paid for at all. So that's what the Patreon is for. The Patreon ba is basically funding me to produce all of the extra content that I'm doing which isn't being paid for. Um, and I like to give something back to my uh, producers and hire, and I do that by means of these giveaways. So yeah, to enter, you just need to be supporting me on Patreon at producer level or higher before tomorrow. So if you want to enter the contest, that's how you do it. Uh, just don't wait too long, because if you don't do it before tomorrow, you'll be entered into next month's contest, which is something different. Still a good prize next month, but it's not Frosthaven. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Mark is here, new patron supporter, love my content. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for your support. Um, Scott is saying, do you think games designers and publishers should set the publication date of their games on BGG? Or should that be left to the BGG admins and owners to decide? Interesting. I think this is in relation to some discussions that I've seen going on about, uh, is it the BGG Awards or the Golden Geek Awards? Uh, or maybe even uh, the Spiel des Jahres and people are arguing about, oh, well, this says it's a 2019 game, but it wasn't available until 2020. If it's that kind of thing, who should set that? I think it should be down to the publisher. Yeah, it shouldn't really be the designer, unless the designer is also the publisher. I think it should be down to the publisher. It should not be left to the BGG admins. The BGG admins, nothing against them, should not be the ones deciding on the information like that. Um, yeah, and it shouldn't be up to the owners of the games. It should be down to the publisher. Now, the responsibility is on the publisher to put the right date on it. Uh, Chuck is saying, what brought you into the board game industry? Did you start it as a hobby or has it always been your career? So I've been a gamer since 1983, I, I think, is about the time. Um, I always I always liked fantasy and sci-fi as a kid. I mean, you know, I've been, I played games as a kid, but... Um, when I got into the fighting fantasy novels in 1983, uh, and then I started playing role-playing games, started playing Dungeons and Dragons, and then that drifted into board games, and then card games, and war games, and everything else. I've been a gamer for, you know, 35 years. Um, it's not always been my career. I, I my, my career was the IT industry. I worked 25 years in the IT industry. Um, I ended up being an IT manager, team of 15 people. I was doing project management, uh, ran a support team of 15 people. That was my job. Um, but in the last few years of that job, I'd, I'd, I'd actually sort of started getting heavily into the board gaming in terms of speaking to publishers. So rather than just being a gamer who plays games, I actually started to introduce myself to publishers because I was fans of their games. I, I, didn't, I didn't go into the board game industry to try and get a job in it. I, went, I started speaking to people like CGE, Watch Your Game, saying, look, I'm a fan. I love your games. Um, is there anything I can do to help? Um, essentially, what I started doing, I, I kind of, they started sending me things and I started helping them with things and talking to them. And then I said, look, if you want me to show your games off at UK conventions, I can do that. And they were like, yeah, sure. So I started doing that. And it kind of snowballed from there. Then I started helping people with rule books. And then it turns out I'm quite good at doing rule books. And people started noticing that. So I thought, oh, okay, well, and then things with my job weren't working out, at which point I was like, okay, maybe I'll, I'll take a bit of a risk on this. And, and I did, and it was a big risk. I left a, a well-paid, secure IT job working for a university, uh, and I set up my own company, and I made the jump, 
and it could have all completely backfired and, and it, thankfully it hasn't. So yeah, it, it's been a hobby my entire life. It's been my passion and I ended up turning it into a job. Um, yeah, it's funny how it worked out, but it wasn't the plan. When I started offering to do work for these companies, it was because I was fans of their games and I just wanted to help them out. I never intended to, to do it full time. Uh, Audrey is saying, if the lockdown continues, what would you go for? <laughs> I think you read this question. <laughs> Elvis do or ponytail? Neither. Neither, Neither says Vicky. It's uh, buy a pair of clippers online, I think, and, and, and get rid of it. It's actually been, it's been a bit messy today, but I think it, I th it's okay at the moment. It's never been as long as this. I've been through the worst bit where it was a straggly mess, and now it's long enough that I can actually, yeah. Um, are there any online games you now want a physical copy of having played online? Yes, all of them. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, <clears throat> having physical copies of games is, is, is obviously better than the online versions. But there's no way that I can have physical versions of all of the games that I want to play online. Thankfully, most of the ones that I'm playing online now, you know, Aeon's End, um, Brass Lancashire we played. Uh, there's a few other ones as well. I've actually got the physical, oh, Undaunted. I'm playing a lot of Undaunted online. I've got the physical game. People I know have bought the game and I'm now playing it with them online. And I think at least one of the people who I've taught how to play the game online using Tabletop Simulator has now ordered it. So that's the other side of having games available online. Kabuki Kid, what is the oldest game in your collection that you still enjoy? Now that is a good question. Oldest game in my collection that I still enjoy playing. Wow. Okay, so I've got some games. I mean, I've got some games going back, you know, quite a long way. I've got old versions of Axes and Allies. Do I still enjoy Axes and Allies? I don't enjoy the old version. Uh, I, 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 I do enjoy it. The problem with Axes and Allies is it takes eight to 10 hours to play. Old games that I still enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back 21 years rather than 30 years. So when I, yeah, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. Okay. First came out in 1982. I wouldn't play the, 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 the 10 cases again because I've played them. But I, I'm going back to like the late 90s. I've got Princess of Florence. I've got Ra. I still enjoy those games. So yeah, there are games from 20 odd years ago that I, I still enjoy playing. Uh, another question from Andrew. Do you have a favourite tea? I don't actually drink tea or coffee. So no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I gave up tea or coffee in 97. I went back on coffee three years ago. Was it three years ago? And I have spent the last two and a half years, spent three years trying to give up. And in this January, I did manage to give up finally. So yeah, I don't drink tea or coffee. Uh, Jason is saying, in my opinion, what is the best way to get other people, brackets, his wife, more into board games? I'm a new player and struggling to find players due to the current world issues and stuck with the wife. <laughs> it all depends whether she is interested in playing games or not. OK, um, if she's interested in playing games, then you've got a good head start, right? If she's not interested in playing games, then you might be in the same situation I'm in at home where Vicky does not like playing games. However, however, and here's the thing, I, I want to, I, I like playing games, OK? I also like spending time with Vicky. Playing games and spending time with her at the same time is great, and I love doing that. But she doesn't like playing games. So what we've done is we have found games that we enjoy playing together. For example, escape room games. So escape room games or detective games like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, any kind of escape room game, Unlock, Exit, uh, Escape Tales, anything like that. For me, I'm getting my fix of playing a game and I'm also spending time with Vicky. So some would say that they're not games. But if it's an activity that you can try, try them with her because you're working together. I would definitely stick with cooperative to start with. Definitely stick with cooperative, um, something where you're working together and obviously don't go super complex. Don't put on Mars in front of her and say, oh, this will be a nice, easy game. You want ones which you can explain in two to three minutes 
Uh, and even even if it's a cooperative game, you don't even have to explain all of the rules up front. You can just sort of explain it as you go. Um, good luck with it. Pop on the BGG Guild and post it on there. It's a very good question. The question is, which, yeah, if you go onto BGG, guild number 2258, feel free to post this as a question. And the question is, for those people who have partners who don't like playing games, what games have you managed to play with them that they've enjoyed playing? Uh, right, Mark says, Paul, which upcoming Kickstarter are you interested in or think people should be? Now, <laughs> the thing is, because I now work in the industry, my focus is on what I'm doing today, what I'm doing this week, what I'm doing next week, and what I'm doing over the next couple of months. Five or six years ago, I was fully aware of what was going on in the board game industry, uh, the, the board game hobby. I knew what games are coming out. I'd be able to have conversations about what upcoming games are coming uh, and what I'm excited about. Now, unfortunately, my brain is filled with what's going on right now. And that means I actually don't know at all what's coming out in a few weeks time other than the ones that I'm directly involved in. So I can tell you Mini Express is on Kickstarter right now. OK, uh, Kaliwala, Tale of Sampo is on Kickstarter right now. The Detective Society that I did a preview video for on Tuesday, that's on Kickstarter right now. Frosthaven's on Kickstarter right now. That's all I know. I don't I don't really know what's coming out next week, next month or anything. Um, it's a bit of a shame in a way that I'm not as in touch with the actual board game hobby and what's coming out as other people are. But it's impossible to be, um, you know, with, with, with the amount that I work in the industry and what I've got going. I could tell you about Vital Lacerda's next two games, but I'm not allowed to. I can tell you what Vladi Shavatl's working on, but I'm not allowed to. So my brain is filled with all of this extra stuff that's going on, which I'm not allowed to talk about. And that just, that fills it up. But that's another good question for people in the chat. So for those people who are still watching, what upcoming Kickstarter games are you interested in or you think should be? And more importantly, what Kickstarter games are coming up soon that you think I would be interested in? Let us know in the chat and Vicky will let me know. Uh, how do dice games play on Tabletop Simulator? Um, really well. I mean, as I mentioned, we've been playing Undaunted Normandy and that has dice in it. Basically, a dice is an object in Tabletop Simulator. And you press the R key and it rolls it. Or you can group a bunch of dice together, press the R key and it rolls them all together. So yeah, it, it does, it shuffles decks, it can do random stuff, um, it can roll dice, it can do all sorts of things. You've said like Lucidity and Fleet to Dice. I haven't played either of those games, so I can't, I can't say specifically how it handles those. What you've got to be careful about though is if you pick up a dice in Tabletop Simulator and move it very quickly, it rolls it because it's a physics engine. It's like, it's like you're throwing the dice across the table. <clears throat> so in a dice placement game, if you're picking up a four and wanting to put it somewhere else, if you're not careful, you might accidentally roll it. So you just need to be careful with that. Um, another question in from Ray. What has Vicky discovered about you since changing jobs and working from home? And Vicky says, so Vicky used to work from home on Fridays anyway. Um, so nothing, nothing really new and nothing terrible. Just how loud I talk when I'm recording and generally talking about games. So yeah, Vicky's in the other room and she's having to make phone calls because of her work. And then she'll hear me in here tapping away. And then all of a sudden I'll start doing a recording and the level of my voice goes up a lot. Are we caught up with the chat? You're still typing away. It's asking me if I can send. Oh, right. Okay. So I can switch to the chat now. It's been really weird not looking, not looking at the chat. But I've, I've trusted Vicky to do that. So let, let me know how you think this went. Um, yeah, if you think it went better, I mean, for me, it felt a lot less stressful for me because I wasn't having to run around all the other place. You're giggling away. So <laughs> I don't know why you're giggling away. Um, but yeah, for me, it was definitely, um, it was definitely less stressful. Um, there we go. Uh, oh, and Thomas is here from Tale of Sampo. There you go. Um, What's all these other things? He does like to project. It went better. If there are more gaming rules videos coming. Ah, Kim, hi Kim. Yes, more gaming rules videos coming. What do you wanna know? Nothing tonight, I'm taking tonight off. We're gonna watch a couple of episodes of Arrow Series 3 and I'm gonna put away Nemo's War, which the bits have been all over the floor. Um, 
too many bones where the bits have been all over the floor. <laughs> I've got three games now that actually need sorting out. So that's what's happening tonight. What's happening tomorrow? I, have, I lose track of time. Tomorrow is... Where's my work calendar? Bear with us a minute. Talk amongst yourselves. Work calendar. Because some of the stuff I'm doing is private. Uh, tomorrow, yes, right, tomorrow, 1 p.m., Gloomhaven Digital, part 17 of our Gloomhaven campaign. That's happening at 1 p.m. tomorrow. I'm doing rulebook work in the morning. Then at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, I am doing a solo game of On Mars. Two player. Yeah. So me and Andy from One Man and His Meeple, we're getting together using the power of the internet, and we're going to be playing through On Mars as a solo game. So On Mars has a solo mode. Andy has played it solo, I haven't, and we're actually going to be playing it together. So we're playing the solo game, but we're both going to be playing it together. That's tomorrow afternoon, starting at three o'clock. So that's probably going to last about three hours, I think. Tomorrow night, I'm going to be playing Aeon's End, but that's a private game. And then Friday, Friday, five o'clock, I am playing through, it's down there, uh, I'm doing a live tutorial and playthrough of The Phantom, the card game which goes on Kickstarter at four o'clock on Friday. So Friday afternoon, the Kickstarter goes live, and an hour after it goes live, I am doing a live tutorial and playthrough of The Phantom, the card game. So a new card game based on The Phantom. It's an officially licensed game using all of the artwork from the actual comics. That's happening on Friday. Friday night, the thing that I haven't actually announced anywhere yet, but I have been speaking to the publisher today, I am going to be doing a live playthrough of Vindication uh, from Orange Nebula Games. Now, the reason I haven't announced this yet is I've been speaking to Orange Nebula because we're going to be using Tabletop Simulator. And I didn't want to do a live stream of their game on Tabletop Simulator without their blessing. So I got hold of them last night. I've had a conversation with them. They've responded today and they've said, Paul, we'd love you to give the game some coverage. Uh, and because they were, they're not able to get me a physical copy of the game, we're going to be playing it online. So that's going to be happening Friday night, probably starting at 7 o'clock UK time. That's Friday. Saturday, and again, I haven't really announced this yet, but Saturday at 5 o'clock UK time, I'm doing a seven-player game of just one with uh, friends in America who are part of Punchboard Media, which is a network that I'm part of. So that's what's happening this week. Next week, I've got my latest video log. I've got a Ride of the Rails game that I haven't announced yet. I've got a playthrough of Uthea, which I haven't really announced yet. Uh, then the week after that, I've got Maharaja. Second edition of Maharaja is coming out. That's the week after next. Then I'm doing an actual how to play video on Undaunted North Africa. Then I've got Solar Storm later in the month. Yeah, there's going to be loads more. Basically, I'm going to be trying to put out as much content as I can while this lockdown continues. Uh, I will probably have to slow it down a bit after that because it is impacting a lot on my on my paid job. Um, yeah, so there you go. Caroline is here in the chat. Vindication. Yeah, that will be happening. Thank you very much for teaching me how to play. I've forgotten half of it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I, I really enjoyed that game and I want to play it again. Um, people are talking in the chat about two player games that are good. Is that presumably for the guy to play with his wife? Yeah, so Jaipur, Raptor, Lost Cities, Battle Line, light, light two-player games that you can get your boyfriend to play. Yeah, yeah, they're good ones. Um, and am I going to make you back Maharaja? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So I've got the original version of Maharaja. Maharaja, when it came out and I've played it, I thought it was a brilliant game. But it has a problem. And interestingly enough, when I spoke to Simone Luciani from Craneo Creations, who are publishing the new edition of Maharaja, my first question to him is, have you fixed the runaway leader problem? Because there's so little luck in the game. Once one player gets ahead, that's, that's, and he went, Paul, that's the first problem I fixed. And I'm like, right, okay. So I don't know much about it. Cranio have sent me a prototype. It arrived this week. It's downstairs in a box, but I am going to be doing a tutorial and playthrough video of the new edition of Maharaja. I don't know how. I assume we'll still be in lockdown at the time. So it's going to have to be played remotely. I don't quite know how I'm going to do it, but that's supposed to be uh, a week after next. Uh, and Joe is saying that you played Vindication with the group. You definitely like to try it again sometime. Well, if you weren't working on Friday, Joe, because Joe's over in America, uh, on the west coast of America, so I think you're seven or eight hours behind me. 
Um, if you're not working on Friday, let me know and we can play a game together, which would be great. Uh, Kabuki Kid wants to know what my biggest hobby outside of board gaming is. Now, somebody asked me this on um, Twitter earlier this week, and I said board gaming is my biggest hobby outside of board gaming. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually, if, if you're talking proper hobbies, I don't actually have any other hobbies. Um, yeah, geocaching, we do, we, w once every few weeks, sometimes once every six months, we'll go out and we'll do some geocaching. But other than that, I'm afraid my life is, is fairly boring. It's just, um, yeah, it's, ge it's just the usual board gaming, watching TV, and we'll go out and do some geocaching now and again. Um, when you consider how much of IT consists of explaining rather complex systems to people, it makes good sense that an IT professional would be good at rule books. Well, possibly, but I don't actually think it's that that's made me good at rule books. I think, I think what I, I do, I've done seminars at events. Uh, we'll wrap things up in the next five minutes, but an hour and a half is normally a good time. Um, I, I've done seminars at a few events over the last few years where I've done a seminar on how to be a good rulebook writer or editor. And the start of the seminar is done to try and get a reaction. So what I do is I ask the audience, I say, right, hands up, who here thinks that I have a degree in English? Okay, and a, and a few people put their hands up and I go, no, 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 I don't have a degree in English. How many th people here think I've got an A-level, like an advanced qualification in English? And quite a lot of other people put their hand up. And I go, no, no, don't have that. And I went, hands up, who thinks I just about scraped through my O-level English, which is GCSE? Another question, okay. Um, and people go, no, surely not. And I go, yep. So. When we go back to actual school, you know, 30 odd years ago, I wasn't very good at English. In fact, 10 years ago, I wasn't very good at English. So to be a good rulebook writer or editor doesn't require a degree in English. You don't need to know all of these things. I think what makes me a good rulebook editor and writer is I'm very, very fussy, okay? I don't mind speaking my mind. If I read a sentence, it doesn't make sense, I will say, this doesn't make sense, okay? I think I'm quite good at being stupid. So if somebody says, you play a card from your hand, I'll say, where? Where does it go? Does it go face up? Does it go face down? I'm, I'm, I've got such an attention to detail, and this is this is part of my personality makeup. I, am, I have got quite a lot of OCD. Uh, I am a, a lot of a perfectionist in a lot of areas, which is a bad thing, it's not a good thing. Turns out, it's quite a good thing for this. I don't, I don't let something lie. I will stick at something until it's as good as it can be. Um, and all of that has all led me to actually turn out, it, they are good skills to have as a rulebook editor. Of course, I do need to know when to use a semicolon and not a comma, but I have Google for telling me that. Right, what's the question that got asked then? And where's that document gone? Here we go, let's see what somebody asked. Uh, this is another one from Adam. What is gonna be the first thing we do when the world gets back to normal? Well, it, play games. The thing is, it's not affecting us that much because we can still go for a walk once a day as our part of our daily exercise. We can still go to the shops. We generally didn't go out that much, but we have talked about going to London to do an escape room. It probably won't be the first thing we do when the lockdown ends. I don't know what the first thing we will do is. Um, and the one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to start rushing off to a beach and start hugging everybody just because I can. Um, because then the second wave is going to come back. That was not a pun, wave, beach. Um, you know what I mean. Um, Kabuki Kid, do you play any video games? Now, when you say video games, I'm not a console person, right? I've not re I, I've got, I got a Nintendo 64 in 98 and 99 and played it for a year and that's it. I'm not into all of this Nintendo Switch. I don't have anything like that whatsoever. So I don't play video games in that way in terms of games on the computer not at the moment because any time i have i will just pop on my slack channel and say who wants a game of something online and i will play a board game online so there's not much in the way that i play actual video games there are video games that i have played in the past which i thought were fantastic i thought dishonored as a computer game was brilliant i thought bioshock the first bioshock was amazing dead space was amazing. Um, 
yeah, th those games were really good. I've also played a lot of like the strategy games, turn-based strategy games like Civ uh, and lots of things like that. Um, there's a number of other computer games that I do like as well, but I don't have that much time for them at the moment. And I am, as, as you will see from some of the streams that I've been doing, I've been playing a lot of digital versions. So Twilight Struggle, uh, Gloomhaven, things like that. I've been playing a lot of digital versions of board games. Um, so yeah, did I video game once in a while? Yeah, not, not, really, not really as a console video gamer, but I have played a lot of in the past World of Warcraft, Guild, um, Guild Wars 2, things like that. I don't play them anymore because they're just a time sink. Um, but yeah, I have played other ones. Favourite Alexander Fister game? Uh, yours is Mombasa. Yeah, it would probably be Great Western Trail. I think Great Western Trail is probably my favourite one, but I do want to play Maracaibo more. I think Maracaibo is a brilliant game, um, and I, I do want to play it more, but I think Great Western Trail is just... It's so well designed and it's so polished, so it's really good. Um, right, two minutes to go before dinner time, so I think that's probably it. Contest. Final, final chance to enter the contest. Send me an email, paul.grogan at outlook.com, and you need to put Fort Walla Walla. I mean, is that a real place? It's got to be a real place because it's on this map. So, yeah, it's a city in America. It's just northwest of... I don't know how you pronounce that. It's east of Portland. I can, I can pronounce Portland. It's B-O-I-S-E. And I don't know how you pronounce it. Is it Boise? 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 I don't know. Anyway, Fort Walla Walla. Send me an email, paul.grogan at outlook.com with Fort Walla Walla. If you are a patron supporter, please mention that in the email. And at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, I will be doing the draw and somebody is going to win £25 worth of vouchers from Games Law. And don't forget, if you like the content that I make and you want to support me on Patreon to help keep the channel going and help me buy more kit uh, and produce more content, please check out the Patreon page. And if you are a producer level or higher, by tomorrow you will automatically get entered into the draw to win a copy of Frosthaven. There we go. Thank you very much for everybody for joining in the chat. This has been really enjoyable and it's been a lot less stressful. So if you can do this next time, what it might mean is that my live Q&As are on a Wednesday or I just start them at 5.30, but then you're having to do it when you come home from work. So this is what I might do moving forward. I might make it the last Wednesday of every month is the live Q&A so that we've got a fixed time. Vicky helps me out like this. Very good. So thank you very much for everybody for joining in. Uh, people are saying Boise in the chat. Boise. Right, okay. Not not boys. <laughs> Brilliant. I'll see you all next time. Uh, stick around for more content later in the week. And uh, yeah, take care, everybody. Look after yourselves. Proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com.